morning, everybody, and welcome to the informational webinar for our 2022 Active School Travel Pilot Program. Just have a few housekeeping items before we start. So as you've probably seen, the webinar is going to be recorded. Uh, if you know of anyone who's unable to attend today, they'll be able to watch the recording on our YouTube channel after tomorrow. We'll provide the link on our program page and we'll also email it out to all of you as soon as it's posted. I'm sure that many of you are comfortable using Zoom 19 months into this pandemic, but for those who aren't as familiar with the webinar format, just wanna mention a few of the features that we're using today. So if you do not see the chat box, you can find that icon on the toolbar at the bottom of your screen, it's near the left side. And if you click that, it should open. I think lots of you have found that already by posting your name, so that's great. Um, if you have any technical questions or have a comment to make, you can use that chat box where my colleague Jacob is ready to assist. We will also have time at the end for our question and answers. So you're welcome to post your questions at any time using the Q&A feature, which is same toolbar, but on the right side. And those questions, if you see one that's already been asked that's similar to yours, you can just upvote it for emphasis. And then you'll also see that we have turned on live transcript today for accessibility. If you wish to turn it off, you can do that at the bottom of your screen next to the Q&A by selecting the tiny little arrow there on the live transcript icon and then hide subtitles. If you need to make the text bigger or smaller, you can adjust that by selecting that same arrow and then subtitle settings and you'll see that there. So thank you very much for all of the intros in the chat. It's really nice to see good bike, bad day on the bike is always better than a good day in the car. I totally agree with that. Um, nice to see Happiness mentioned there, healthy, makes me feel exhilarated usually, I agree. Um, I'm sure there's lots of transportation and active transportation enthusiasts in the group here today. So thanks for sharing that. Um, next slide, please, Yvonne. Thank you. So before we get started, I would like to acknowledge the surrounding traditional lands of the Kosapsum and the Kwangan Nation where we work, live and learn. Next slide, please. Our agenda for today includes introductions, the pilot program overview, participation details, eligibility, the application process, and some time for questions and a short evaluation poll in lieu of a follow-up survey. So if you could please stick around till 11 o'clock so that you can answer those two quick questions for us. Next slide. Great, so we'll kick things off with some introductions. Next, please. All right, so for those of you that don't know me, which are probably many of you, my name is Laura Hube and I'm the Active School Travel Program Coordinator here at BC Healthy Communities. My interest in active school travel started way back in elementary school when I would rollerblade to and from in the spring and fall. And then in middle school without realizing it, I even now start, even started what I now know is called a walking school bus program with other kids in my neighborhood. And this was in the days before smartphones, so it required real-time coordination. And if you missed that bus stop, you were on your own, which I feel is an important life lesson. I have a master's degree in urban and regional planning with a specialization in planning for healthy communities. And both my thesis and internship were focused on active and safe routes to school and healthy school environments. I have since worked in both planning and public health in the private, public, and nonprofit sector in Canada and the US. And I also sit on the board of directors for the Active School Travel Canada Working Group. My colleague Stacy, you can see there on the slide and waving, um, will be presenting toward the end of our webinar today. She's our grants and administration coordinator at BCHC and she manages the administrative side of the Active School Travel Pilot Program. And then behind the scenes, our awesome team is supporting me on this webinar today by managing the chat, Q&A and advancing the slides. So I wanna acknowledge and thank Yvonne, Johanna, Jacob, Emily and Jody for ensuring that this webinar fl flows as smoothly as possible, fingers crossed. <laughs> Next slide, please. We also have two special guest speakers for you today from our current cohort of pilot schools to share their perspective and experience of being a project lead this year. So we'll hear from Janet and Cedric a little bit later on. Janet is a project lead for a rural elementary school and she'll speak to her experience with engaging with the supports available through our program. While Cedric is a recent graduate of a suburban secondary school, and will speak more on his unique experience of being a student co-project lead. Next slide, please. 
So for those of you that don't know BC Healthy Communities, we are a provincial nonprofit that operates at the intersection of planning and public health. We work with community partners across sectors to create healthy communities. And part of our healthy communities philosophy is a fundamental commitment to equity, ensuring that systemic disadvantages don't get in the way of community members' aspirations for their lives and the lives of their families. We are an interdisciplinary team of planning, public health, evaluation, and public engagement specialists who believe that it is possible and necessary to create communities where it's easy for citizens to be healthy and well. Next slide, thank you. So the Active School Travel Pilot Program is a pilot initiative that's funded by the BC Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure. This pilot supports the province's goal of adopting Vision Zero, which would see no fatalities or serious injuries resulting from collisions or crashes on the road. It also aligns with Clean BC's active transportation strategic priorities, such as doubling the percentage of trips taken with active transportation by 2030 and inspiring British Columbians of all ages and abilities to choose active transportation with incentives that encourage active transportation use. Next slide, please. Okay, so why is this important? First, I would like to define what I mean by active tra transportation. So active transportation refers to all human powered forms of travel. Walking and cycling are the most common, but running, scootering, skateboarding, rollerblading, using a wheelchair, paddling, skiing, snowshoeing, horseback riding, and using electric bikes or scooters are also types of active transportation. In our program, we define active school travel to include a partially active trip, such as taking the drive to five approach when a child is dropped off a five minute walk away from school and finishes the trip actively, or taking the bus and walking partway from their home to the bus stop and or from the bus stop to school. One of the things that I love most about active school travel is that it comes with multifaceted benefits and can appeal to different people for different reasons. For example, people may choose active modes of travel because of the physical health benefits it offers, or perhaps for improved mental health a desire for greater community connectedness, improved learning outcomes, to lessen their environmental footprints, or in an effort to build more childhood autonomy, or it may be a combination of, or even all of these reasons. People may also not have a choice when it comes to their mode of active travel. It is an affordable option that provides students and families with the opportunity to connect with their friends, neighbors, and communities, and improves their physical and mental well-being. Active school travel programs have been shown to success, be successful in supporting a number of positive health, learning, and environmental outcomes, including improvements in mental health, safety, academic performance, and air quality. I invite you to share your why for engaging in active school travel in the chat. So why is it important to you? And while you're doing that, we'll move on to the next slide. So <clears throat> here I'm going to get into an overview of our pilot program. Next slide, please. Our program has been adapted from leaders in the field at Ontario Active School Travel and other active and safe routes to school programs in Canada. We focus at the local school level and place a high emphasis on the equity lens, as I mentioned about our organization as a whole. This upcoming year of our pilot is informed by feedback and evaluation of our current pilot year, which is still ongoing. And so that feedback and evaluation is continuing to occur and will be used in adapting our program for next year. We will fund up to 10 new schools to build their capacity for active school travel with the goal of more students using active travel modes more often. So more students more often. It's not about doing this 100% of the time perfectly, but rather choosing those modes more often than we currently are and putting the programming in place to encourage that. At the outset, I just wanna be clear that this is not about just funding. It's about funding and it's a committed process with supports in place to build the capacity of schools to increase active travel and to support the development and strengthening of multi-sectoral partnerships. So we'll be learning together as this is a pilot and working to break down the barriers that your school community is facing when it comes to choosing active travel modes. Next slide, please. So this second year of the pilot program will take place from January to December, 2022. This timeline worked quite well for our current cohort and has been intentionally designed to have the pilot learning curriculum, as you can see at the top there, taking place 
up front during those winter months when active travel isn't as common and allowing for that optimal timing of school travel projects to take place when you're ready to implement them during the spring and fall months. And you'll see participation higher in those months. So that's the rationale behind this timeline, just so that you know, even though it's not clear from this diagram, uh, would have broken it up strangely, but we do not require your participation during the summer months. So when school is not in session, you're not required to participate or interact with us, but we are available to support during those months, July and August, if the project leads want that. And that was something that some schools chose this year. Um, the Active School Travel Pilot Program, as I said, is a capacity building grant program that includes an online facilitated learning curriculum, the first component there, access to a curated selection of evidence-based tools, templates, and information resources, a provincial community of practice, and advice and guidance from BCHC to support the development and implementation of school travel plans and projects. So I'll share more details about what is involved in each of these components in the next few slides, but I just wanted to give you that bigger picture idea of how the program is structured. Thank you. So the learning curriculum is a series of modules and tools, template, related tools and templates and resources on various topics that are related to increasing active school travel using Ontario's active school travel planning model. So just a note, we don't require you to complete a school travel plan in its entirety, but you must begin to develop one or update an existing plan that you have. So this is meant to support you to be able to implement in your planning process and any activities that you choose to implement through an equity lens. It's here to set you up for success. Some of the topics that were covered in this past year included navigating active school travel in COVID-19, the six E's of the school travel planning model, which I'll talk more about later, and the phases of school travel planning, applying that equity lens to each of those phases. In evaluating our webinars, one project lead said, it was great to realize what has been missing from our previous work in active transportation at our school. Equity was something that wasn't taken into account before, and we're really grateful to be able to start to look at how to include more people in our efforts. So we are updating our curriculum for this coming year and are adapted to the needs and desires of the selected schools. Please do highlight in your application what you are hoping to learn about. Next slide, please. So our online community of practice is another portion of the program that has been very well received by our current cohort of project leads. It provides the opportunity for sharing and learning across schools, resulting in increased connection and broader knowledge, understanding, and awareness of the range of activities that can be undertaken. We found that the schools really enjoyed having that one-on-one -on -one interaction with each other as well as in a group, and it gave others great ideas. So we are continuing with that for next year. Next slide, please. So with the knowledge gained from that learning curriculum community of practice, the project leads are tasked with facilitating actions at the school level. It is important that these activities plan take that whole school approach and incorporate an equity lens and are informed by engagement with your school community, including students, teachers, parents, staff, and local residents. We recognize that you are the experts of your school community and we can't tell you what will work for you, but we can help you to determine the needs that you have, the questions that should be asked to your community and brainstorming potential solutions. Our program is flexible and not rigid in its process, but rather gives you the tools and information to help you make the decisions that are best and will work for your school. Next slide, please. So when I completed my master's thesis, there were actually only five E's of active school travel, evaluation, education, encouragement, engineering, and enforcement. And you'll still see those outlined in many programs today. But others, including ourselves, have included the sixth E of equity. There have also been a move away in recent years from enforcement measures, particularly in the U.S. Safe Routes to School program. So for ours, with the exception of equity, our selected schools are not required to address all six E's in their project work. You get to determine which of these categories best address the challenges and enhance the strengths of your school. So... Our priority areas that you'll see outlined in the application guide are one, school travel planning, two, strengthening the stakeholder partnerships, collaboration, and coordination to leverage resources and support long-term project sustainability, three, 
executing projects, events, activities, and or improvements that are suited to your community. Or building that public support by raising awareness, sharing news, celebrating your successes, engaging with local champions and leaders. And then also developing or strengthening policy and procedures that support active school travel. We really encourage you to describe in your application how you address any or all of these. It's not required that you address all, but you can choose which ones suit your school. Next slide, please. So to give you some examples, despite going these ongoing challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, our current project leads have really done amazing work this past year. They've administered numerous surveys with record response rates, held engagement encouragement events ranging from inspirational speakers to incentivizing active school travel days and bike to school weeks, bike rodeos, a bike exchange program and bike repair days, and to even one school executing a month long school streets initiative. This school streets initiative achieved incredible outcomes measured through innovative data collection. For example, from April to June, when May was their programming month, they saw an increase of 228% scooters and skateboards at the school, 185% increase of bikes in the racks, and a decrease of 31 to 34% of cars in that drop loop during the morning and afternoon, respectively. Current schools have also offered skills development and safety workshops by partnering with organizations like Hub Cycling and Track, completed graphic design work, for, which you'll see a little bit later, and formed relevant partnerships, local partnerships, installing bike racks, maintenance stations, et cetera. So those are just a few examples. We're really excited to see what kind of projects you guys outline in your application. And with that said, I would now like to introduce Janet to speak with you about her project, work as a project lead for Memorial Muheim, Muheim Memorial Elementary School in Smithers, BC. Next slide. Hi, Laura. Thank you so much. You. Uh, yeah, so I was leading the program on behalf of Muheim Elementary, and it was my first time working with the BC Healthy community. So I didn't really know what to expect. So the learning modules were excellent. They gave us a really good starting point and the guidance in terms of it can be very overwhelming. Um, Muheim specifically is a rural community. And so therefore there's a lot of things that you can't necessarily do. You can't change the streets, you know, you, but at the same time, we wanted to improve the safety around the streets. So looking at creative ways to do that and the shared resources, especially with ICBC, um, there's just extensive and robust learning activities and just great resources for teachers that you can use to address the specific issues that you have. Um, and so, we started out with a survey, as Laura said, and the responses were excellent and getting some really good insight as to the perception of the parents and the students and being able to talk about that with people in the community of practice and get different ideas from different communities was really helpful as well. Um, specifically, I got some excellent support from Laura through the one on one um, just interaction and she was definitely uh, pivotal in being able to bring one of the ideas to life. So if you wanna to go to the next slide, I'll talk about that idea. So we talked about education, engineering and encouragement. And one of the things that came up in the survey was the concern about the safety of the streets. And it's two blocks, the school's two blocks away from Highway 16. So there's not a lot you can do about that. There's people that are coming in hot. There's a lot of parents that have to drop their kids off just because kids don't qualify for active uh, transportation. So we wanted to encourage, like Laura said, connecting that, having that partial active transportation and creating safer streets for the kids that are commuting to school. And one of the things that came up was the parents that are picking their children up can or they were they had limited parking available. So it was creating a lot of congestion and we wanted to start changing the behavior and directing the parents to park in an adjacent parking lot, which is across the street. 
And so to create awareness and educate people and encourage compliance with this idea, we came up with this coloring activity. So it's a take home project that children bring home and we've got it assigned for kids from kindergarten up to grade three, and they are to do it with their parents. And so this is a way for everyone to start to be able to identify the safety concerns. And so if you want to go to the next slide, specifically, you know, when buses are coming into this tight area, um, it's a two lane road that's designed to be uh, shared with bikes and we've got lots of parents and they're parking on uh, crosswalks and stuff so the highlight for this was just to be able to identify areas of concern like around those corners you can see them identified in red and Laura was really uh, pivotal in being able to connect me with the right graphic designer I tried to find somebody on Upwork um, and it just wasn't producing the and delivering the kind of the quality that you can see here. It was a little bit more like a Sims map. So Laura connected me with somebody who's a graphic designer and a teacher, and they both contributed so much to this. And it's just turned out to be better than what I could have imagined. So um, yeah, the one-on-one -on -one support was essential to this, and we're deploying this right now and hoping to see improved uh, compliance with parents and just safer streets. And that's about it for me. Awesome. Thank you, Janet, for sharing this incredible work with us. It's been really fun for me to see this project come to life from this idea that you had and you mentioned on an early community of practice. And it's just, you know, something that was in your head and seeing the struggles that we went through with the initial graphic designers. Like she mentioned, it looked like a video gaming map. And then, you know, finally creating this incredible really resource for your students and parents and and using that educational material from ICBC in there. And yeah, it was really wonderful. And I, I do look forward to hearing about the impact that this has at Muheim. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thanks so much and for the support. For sure. And I'll now speak to what's required of you as a participant in our program. So next slide, please. So as I mentioned already, this is a capacity building grant program. The selected schools will receive $10,000 in funding to support their participation in the pilot's learning curriculum and community of practice throughout that school year. And then as well as the development and implementation of a range of active school travel plans and projects that each selected school decides to embark on. Next slide, please. So to be a project lead, the project lead must have the ability to work with the school in a direct capacity. So that means you must be one of, or a combination of the following, school principal, vice principal, teacher, grade 11 or 12 student, school administrator, parent advisory council member, other role that's directly connected to the local school and supports school-based program planning, such as a program coordinator or a healthy school's lead. Um, if you have questions about whether or not you're able to be a project lead, please feel free to field those questions our way. And we really do highly recommend uh, having that combination of several of these. So having a PAC member, for example, who has a strong connection with the vice principal or a teacher or a grade 11 or 12 student. You'll see an example of that a little bit later who was partnered with a vice principal. And we've really found that partnership to be quite successful. So to be able to participate in the program and execute your selected projects, there is a time requirement. So you must be able to commit approximately 10 hours per month to this program, though we have seen some dedicate more time than this. Um, this includes about three hours per month in webinars, support from BCHC and program feedback, and then around seven hours in project planning time, though that can really vary greatly from project lead to project lead, depending on the scope of your work and the capacity of the project leads, the number of partnerships that you have involved, et cetera. So project lead time, just so you know, can be split between two people if that capacity is an issue, especially I know that everyone has a lot on their plates uh, these days with the pandemic and work and kids and all of these things. So yeah, we're really flexible in that splitting the time and um, look forward to hearing from you if you have any questions about whether or not you can 
be a project lead. So next slide, please. Um, so project leads, they serve as the liaison between BCHC and the school. And so you must be committed to managing the program on behalf of the school. Um, <clears throat> so you have to participate fully in the learning curriculum and community of practice. If we hold these webinars or community practice at times that just don't work for your schedule, then there will be recordings available, although we really do encourage you participating live and we will work with the selected schools to choose times that are best for, suited for everyone. Um, you must agree to using the program resources, as Janet mentioned, they were all really beneficial for her. Um, providing feedback and maintaining communication with us at BCHC about your project activities and outcomes. It's really helpful as we're in a pilot phase to be able to evaluate our program as we're moving through it and adapt as needed. So project leads must coordinate the completion as, of family and hands up surveys. These, this is a requirement of our program for this coming year um, because we really need to see that data collection and you're also required to submit baseline and final reports to us. So we will provide the templates for both of these to you, um, but, and, and they're not, you know, they're not really long encompassing things, but we do require that of you because we need to continue to evaluate our program to build it out for future years. So um, with that said, I, was just wondering, Joe, is Cedric here yet? I'm looking in my chat here. No Cedric yet. So yes, we can just, um, he's in university now and quite busy, but we can just skip over um, Cedric's slides for the moment and we'll come back to them when he's here. He's a really awesome student who we're, we're really excited to share, have him share his story with you all. So um, we'll let, let me know when he comes in and we can go back to that. So the next little section is eligibility, which I'm sure all of you are really curious about. So next slide, please. So who can apply? Schools must be located in British Columbia. Applications are open to all jurisdictions. So we're including public schools, First Nations schools, Métis charter schools and independent schools, any other schools that also, yeah, just indicate that in your application. We are open to all schools located in British Columbia that are in that grade range from K to 12. So typically you see school travel planning happen at the elementary school level, but our program is actually open for all grades, middle schools, high schools, any grade range from K to 12. Um, we're also looking for a range of geographic contexts. So we're including rural, semi-rural, suburban and urban schools. Um, we really want to test through this pilot to see what works and what doesn't in different contexts and focusing on that equity lens. So the active school tra travel pilot program targets local initiatives that operate at a school or school community scale rather than that regional or pro province wide scale. So this means that for this year, we will not be awarding funds to school districts, municipalities, health authorities, and any other organizations that are broader scale, not eligible to submit an application. Um, you can work with someone at a school, like have a school district person or someone at a municipality work with the school, but the project lead must be directly connected to the school. Next slide, please. Awesome. So we will be giving preference to schools that are located in rural, semi-rural, and suburban communities, as well as First Nations schools and schools with significant Indigenous student populations. As I mentioned, at the heart of our work is equity, and we look to ensure an equitable approach to when we're administrating our grants. We also recognize that especially in rural, semi-rural, and First Nations communities and schools, there are less opportunities, for example, with buses and infrastructure, and this grant is to help build on that local capacity to take innovative approaches to active transportation. So that doesn't mean that urban schools shouldn't apply or that they won't be selected. It's just making clear what an equity lens looks like for us, for this program, and for how that will influence the ranking of applications. Urban schools did get selected for this year's pilot, and I'm certain that we will select some again this year. 
with next year. So schools must also have sufficient infrastructure to ensure active travel to and from school is feasible for the duration of the pilot. All that we mean by sufficient infrastructure is that there's already in place the infrastructure needed to support your project. So obviously if you're planning a walking school bus, for example, in an area that does not have sidewalks, that poses a pretty considerable challenge that you'd have to clearly address in your application and the funding wouldn't necessarily get to build you those sidewalks in, in um, rapid time. So um, thirdly, schools must demonstrate the clear motivation and capacity to engage in active school travel planning. For example, a champion staff member at the school to lead the project, an existing school travel plan or program that's already in place that you wanna build on, a commitment from school partners and or parents for an active school travel project. Schools must be willing to promote the pilot to their staff and students and actively encourage participation in data collection and evaluation measures for the purposes of our pilot so that we can continue to learn. As I mentioned before, the lead applicant must be directly connected to the school. Next slide, please. Applicants are required to submit a high level budget with their application. We've worked with our ministry partners to determine what kinds of expenses are eligible and ineligible. So your budget may contain a mix of any of these eligible expense categories, school and community partner expenses that are related to supporting participation in project activities, for example, venue, travel mileage, maybe not as common these, these days, um, food, accommodation, childcare, um, project staff and contractors, such as coordination, facilitation, partnership, development, this means that the project lead can also be accommodated um, and included at being paid some of their grant money. Uh, communication, such as promotional materials, printing and design work, data collection, such as asset mapping, school site walkabout, family surveys, and then also capital costs. Some of you guys had pre previous registration questions around this. So yes, you can include capital costs, such as supplies, equipment, bike racks, However, infrastructure improvements are eligible only to a minimum, a maximum, excuse me, of 40% of the funded amount. Your application must clearly explain how these expenditures will fit into a project that aligns with the AST pilot program's objectives of capacity building and sustainable project outcomes. We strongly encourage schools to pay honorarium to volunteers. We've really found that to be successful and to support local business where possible, especially during these harder COVID times, instead of requesting donations. So I'm aware that Cedric is here. So if you can just return back to his first slide, um, that would be awesome. And so Cedric will speak to you as his ex um, about his experience as a student co-project lead this year. He was at JN Burnett Secondary School in Richmond. So welcome Cedric. Please take the floor. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Cedric. I've long embraced active travel as an avid cyclist. In grade 12, I co-project led my high school's pilot program with my vice principal, Mrs. Lynette Collins. Our partnership was uniquely successful from sharing our workloads and better feeding on our strengths. I could better connect with our target audience of grade eight to 12 students, whereas Mrs. Collins had better connections with the school board for managing administration tasks. Through the AST pilot, my team of peers and I achieved not only infrastructure improvements, but more importantly, education and encouragement. To create a significant, unique, and lasting impact, we needed to educate our students on active travel safety and skills. For our case, we focused on cycling. Once the students have taken that first ride to school, encouraging them to cycle becomes much easier. We installed bike maintenance stations, bike racks, hosted cycling education workshop, and inspired other students to incorporate and innovate with active travel. One of our students even made a bike blender. We created a significant, unique, and lasting impact on the school and local community. Significant because education and infrastructure benefits students, their families, and the wider community. Unique because we took the initiative to educate and encourage active travel an initiative that may not often be endeavored. Lasting, because education stays with students for a lifetime and infrastructure stays with the school and community for generations. The AST pilot helped us make a change towards a better environment, one student at a time. Next slide, please. 
Our initiatives were well timed with the city of Richmond's construction and opening of a bike park along a five kilometer multi-use greenway that our school is situated along. As a student project lead, it's truly been an unparalleled leadership experience, an experience that stands out for many traditional positions. I'm confident that this has been an experience that is difficult to come by, having learned valuable project management skills, communication skills, and negotiation techniques. From this leadership experience, I gained the opportunity and skills to now play an executive role at Hub Cycling's Richmond YVR local committee. Past and present members of our AST pilot team continue to be thankful for the support of students and staff at our school and the BC Healthy Communities team. To be a student project lead was daunting at first, but like my team of peers, we all found rewarding and unique experience from participating in the active school travel pilot program. I personally hope you will give yourself, your school, and your students the chance to make a unique and lasting difference. Thank you. Thank you, Cedric. It was really honestly amazing to see your leadership as a student project lead. Good, I'm not muted. It was really awesome to see uh, your leadership as a student project lead. And, you know, we were, of course, sad to see you move on, but we appreciated you finding a student successor to take your place this fall. And I really hope that Cedric's experience inspires someone in the audience today to seek out that student teacher principal team to co-lead next year. Um, also just wanna congratulate you on, on taking that initiative, um, being unique and different in the sense that we, we didn't anticipate having a student project lead. And there you were, and you did such an amazing job and also leaving a legacy for your school and community. So pretty incredible. Thank you so much for being here. And both Cedric and Janet will be available at the end of the Q&A if you have specific questions for them. So if you can just fast forward on to where we were. Great, so you guys are here today or listening to the recording perhaps because you wanna have a better chance of being selected for our pilot program. And we really do appreciate that. So we just wanna be very open in telling you what would make for a stronger application from you as a school and giving you as much information as possible to build a strong application. So make your case. Tell us everything that you think we should know about your school and your school community. Perhaps share a story that humanizes your application. As I mentioned before, it's important that we have a dedicated project lead or co-project lead who are committed to participating fully in the program. So we're looking for those who will provide feedback to strengthen our program for future years. Indicate your key support partnerships or those that you wish to build that will solidify your ability to execute and achieve the goal of more students choosing active travel more often. You should also highlight your commitment to equity, and we will give you more information on how to do that through the learning curriculum. We're also looking to see how you're focusing your projects that are suited to your, school, excuse me, <laughs> your school community and are expected to have significant and lasting impacts. We've included the priority focus areas in the application guide to help you in determining what kinds of projects we can fund with this program. It's not a requirement for you to do all of these as part of your application, but seeing that a school is thinking about the ways to incorporate these areas in their projects that I mentioned before, um, tells us that you're thinking about the important elements that will ensure project growth and sustainability over the longer term. Lastly, be sure to include these projects that take whole school approaches rather than those that only benefit one segment of the school population. With that said, I'm going to hand it over to Stacy to discuss the application process. Next slide. Thanks, Laura. Um, I'm Stacy. I'm the uh, Grants and Engagement Coordinator for BCHC, and I'm just going to take you through the application and adjudication process for the program very quickly before we get to our questions. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, I just want to mention uh, that links to the program website and application will be posted in the chat section here. Uh, but you can always find this information by going to the BC Healthy Communities website and following the links to the active school travel program. So we've developed um, a pretty substantial application guide, and I encourage every applicant to review this before starting your application. Uh, as Laura's mentioned, um, we have pretty clear and concise goals for the program, and this application guide 
outlines all those goals, the types of projects we fund, and the details about eligibility. These are the criteria that we will be using to select schools for the program. Applications are submitted online using a fillable web form. A link to the web form is on our website. It's also in the application guide. And I think it's gonna be posted in the chat, um, but it is in the application guide that we're linking. And um, when you're completing the web form, it's really important to be sure to answer all of the questions to the best of your ability. The information you provide there is what we will use to help understand your project goals and how you fit in our program. We expect the application could take about an hour for most projects, not for everybody, a little bit more for some, uh, but just rest assured you'll be able to uh, go back and check your answers and edit them uh, throughout the program before you submit, and you're also able to save and return your application. Uh, you'll see once you get to the second page of the application, a little notice at the top saying save and return, and if you select that, it'll ask for an email, and uh, once you affirm, it will send you a, a link that will bring you back to the exact same page on the application. If you don't see that email fairly soon in your inbox, check your junk folder because you will need that link. Um, one key thing to remember is that during the application, you will be asked to submit a budget, as Laura mentioned, that's a requirement of the application. And a link to the budget template is in the application guide, so you can prepare this in advance. You'll also have the opportunity to upload extra documents to support your application. So those could be anything from letters of support from community partners. It could be data that um, you've gathered about your school situation, or it could be previous work you've done on active school travel. Unlike the budget, those extra documents are not required for your application to proceed. But if you do have them, we really encourage you to include them. Very importantly, our deadline uh, is December 2nd, 2021, this year at 11.59 p.m. And that is Pacific Daylight Time. So our time here in Victoria. And feel free to contact us with any questions as you're going through your grant application. Our emails will be at the end of uh, the slide presentation here. And they're also on the BC Healthy Communities website. Uh, next slide, please. So a little bit about adjudication. I'm a process person, so I like to know how things are done. So I'll talk to you about a bit. Um, we form a panel uh, at BCHC to review the, review the applications and we will go through every application that is submitted. The first thing we're gonna look at is whether you meet those eligibility requirements that Laura outlined and which are outlined in the application guide. Then we're also gonna look at the projects and consider um, how they have uh, uh, and whether they've included the equity, um, equity considerations, they're planning to be sustainable over time, and the commitment to participate in the learning modules and also our documentation and reporting process to support our pilot program. And as a whole, we'll want to make sure that we're reaching um, schools from across the province uh, that are diverse in population. If we need further clarification from you, we could reach out to you. We'll use the email that you provide for your primary contact to do that if we have any questions. And we expect to notify applicants of the result uh, of our decision uh, around December 16th, so mid-December to give you a bit of time to prepare for 2022. I think we'll go to next slide and I think we're coming up to questions now. So, ah, we have some Thank questions you, posted. So the floor is now open for you to pose your questions. With this webinar format, uh, you must use the Q&A feature, which I mentioned at the beginning, which is on the bottom toolbar toward the right side. And you can post your question there. If a question that has already been asked is something that you're interested in knowing, you can also upvote that one for emphasis. So um, Stacy's going to pose the questions and then myself or Janet or Cedric uh, are here or even Stacey to answer some of them. So please do feel free to pose any questions that you have. Yeah, we have some here. So the first one I have is, will you be working in tandem with the school district? So, yeah, that was a question that was asked prior. I think we answered that. So not at this time, but we do encourage our schools to strengthen those relationships with the school districts. Um, if, if applicable to them. So, yeah. 
The second question um, we've got is, can this program be used to create sidewalks or put in painted sidewalks or slow down crosswalk signs for safety? Yeah, um, our program will provide you with information and share information on how to effectively work with municipal and the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure. So we'll, we'll help to facilitate those partnerships that are responsible for the roads around schools. And then in the learning curriculum, we'll just include a section on how infrastructure decisions get made at municipalities and at the ministry. And then we'll share some grant funding opportunities that are available to support AT infrastructure. Um, uh, creating sidewalks is, is expensive and time consuming and a lot of partners. We can definitely help you start that process. Um, and some of those things like maybe a crosswalk sign is actually within the realm of that 40% max eligible infrastructure funding. But um, yeah, I think, I think that helps. Hopefully that helps. If not, you can post in the chat and just let me know. Um, so we have from Chris, uh, what are the longer term plans for the after school travel program? I'm not certain my school is quite ready and may need more time to develop a plan and build staff interest. Will the pilot be ongoing next year? Or are you expecting to implement this on a larger scale? Thank you for that question. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. I, I appreciate you asking that question. I absolutely hope that this program is around for the long term. Uh, we, we definitely have plans to build it out. And as with, as with all pilots, you know, we have to show that what we're doing is working and is successful. So it is in the plans. Um, I, would, I would definitely encourage you to to reach out and, and let's just see where you're at. If you're not sure that your school's quite ready, um, building staff interest and stuff can happen as you, you engage in our learning curriculum. So yeah, please please don't like let that discourage you from applying and, and reach out if you wanna have a conversation about where you're at right now. Thank you for your question. And from Aaron, we have, what have people in the past asked for funding to go toward any standout? Hmm. Yeah. Um, so as Cedric mentioned, he used the funding for maintenance stations, bike racks and things, uh, standout probably was a school asking to use the money for purchasing skateboards for, for their entire school community. Um, they're using those skateboards and painting them and it's a really cool, uh, affordable way to apply that whole school approach. So that was, that was pretty unique. Uh, from Nicole, we are a small remote northern town of 2,500 residents with two schools, an elementary and a high school. Are we able to apply once to run this program in both schools, or would we need to run separate program applications for each actual school? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I don't know that I have an answer for that right now. Maybe Jody could speak to it or we can connect with you, Nicole, um, when we've had a chance to flesh that out with our ministry partners. All right. Um, another question about rural projects. Uh, how can we best adapt in a rural setting? So, um, yeah, I think that that question might be better answered one-on-one -on -one, and I'd be happy to chat more about your specific school and the challenges that you're facing there. Um, you know, I don't know, maybe Janet, did you want to speak a little bit to the rural setting? Sure. Um, sorry. Yeah, it, um, it's definitely kind of daunting, I think, when you come into the program and you, you're speaking to a lot of different representatives from urban areas that have access to a lot of infrastructure that you just don't, you can't access with $10,000. And so it can kind of feel like, oh, well, what am I going to do? And that's where I think the resources really came in. And they were so broad and deep and had such great ideas. And then having those learning modules, you know, the educate, like engineer isn't the biggest dial mover for, you know, in, in terms of changing people's behavior. Yes, it's an important part, but I think that, you know, even just being on this webinar and seeing everybody introduce themselves and how many people are engaged, the energy is there and there's the desire to create these programs. And it's just about finding the best way to create those opportunities for people to join in. 
you know, these are grassroots kinds of initiatives, and I think that you have all the resources that you need, and it's great to see everybody on this webinar, and that's the thing, it's, there's a lot of different people from different backgrounds, and it's fun to get the ideas flowing and talk to people and hear what different communities are doing and get ideas from them. Awesome, thank you. That's really helpful, Janet. And yeah, I mean, active school travel does include such a multifaceted group of, of people from different backgrounds. And so um, pulling on that, there's just so many options and we can definitely adapt to that rural island setting, but uh, we just wanna speak a little further about specifics. So any other questions? Um, we have a question, can we do bicycle safety programs? Yes, absolutely. So um, some of our current schools have partnered with iRide, Hub Cycling. We've given a lot of information through ICBC about safety. Um, Hub Cycling has Everyone Rides Grade 4 5, which is a great one that was included with one of our schools. And another school started the Learn to Ride program with their grade 9 students. And their plan is to do that every year for the next five years so that the long term, every single student will have received that. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, another infrastructure question. Uh, how do you obtain road infrastructure to promote active school travel? Yeah, I think I think I answered that one with yeah. the sidewalks bit, just that you know we we will teach about about how to get those how those infrastructure decisions get made at the municipality in Modi, and we'll we'll help you to build those partnerships. So it's not really something that is going to be possible within the scope of our program. Uh, $4,000 doesn't go a long way with road infrastructure. So, so definitely not something that we can take on, um, but we can help you to start that process if you're also wanting to look at other projects. Um, what is the percentage of projects that were put in place in the last year pilot continued in this school year? In other words, what kind of successes were achieved and maintained? Good question. Um, so, one example I can give was with the school streets. As I mentioned, they were quite successful. They chose to run another month long school streets this fall um, and had a few more struggles with um, COVID outbreaks at the school and things like that. But uh, we're still waiting on that data and they also have plans to expand that program next year. Um, one of our schools purchased a fleet of mountain bikes and they plan to keep those and have that kind of build on that program next year. And we also have ideas in the works for how to continue to work, it, work with our current uh, cohort of schools. So yes, we definitely see that active school travel programming across the board. Sometimes what happens is that there's someone who's the local champion of a school and they move on as a perhaps getting relocated to another school or their child graduates. And so we really are working with the schools to build that succession plan should that lead person walk away because we do, we do want to see long-term sustainable outcomes. Um, I have two more. Sure. Uh, what are the typical barriers preventing students from riding bikes to school? Yeah, this is a, this is a, a big question. I'd say there are many. Um, Firstly, it's a bit of an affordability thing with cycling. So, um, you know, bikes are expensive. Um, you also, maybe distance would be an issue, safety concerns, lack of adequate infrastructure, um, just knowledge and, and being able to ride a bike. Um, do parents feel safe letting their kids ride? Uh, it's like weather issues when it's rainy or dark outside, visibility, uh, just that, again, knowing how to ride a bike. And as I mentioned, some of those programs that um, help, help you teach your students how to A, ride a bike, B, maintain a bike. Um, and there's other organizations that actually work to like remove the barriers uh, around affordability. We have an example of a company called ReBicycle in Langford. And so they provide bikes for free and it's just an exchange program and it's really wonderful. Um, I don't know if Cedric wanted to speak a little bit to the barriers um, to riding a bike. You know, you mentioned that, uh, you know, getting a student to ride once will then help them take that next ride. So I don't know if you have anything to add to that. 
Right, yeah. So uh, with the secondary school, high school students, uh, we found that a lot of the times it wasn't as much of a parent barrier. Um, you know, they're, they're at this age where they can kind of make decisions on their own and their parents aren't necessarily involved. Rather, it's more about getting that incentive to actually start biking. A lot of the times they don't actually see like, you know, what's the benefits of active travel, like for health and for, uh, you know, community engagement uh, and even for convenience. Like one of our selling points was that, um, you know, it's really, it's very convenient. Like instead of getting someone to drop you off and you're always stuck in traffic, you can take a bike, you just park your bike, lock your bike in the bike rack, and then you're uh, in your classroom. Uh, so what we did was we used kind of snacks um, we had a, a program that was also aligned with the Hub Bike to School Week. And so we, we did this campaign that helped, um, you know, students kind of just incentivize them to come out with the, with the active school travel pilot program funding. That's great. Thank you. Um, I, okay, I said I'm there was pause so that we can run our poll questions, but we can stick around for a little bit longer if anybody has, uh, I know there are still a few questions there in the queue and um, we can stick around after we run the poll. We just didn't wanna take your time doing a survey following. So here are two quick questions and I think Joe is gonna pull that up now. Awesome. So I see that one of you, a couple of you now are saying to number two, no different reason. Um, if you could please send a message to all panelists in the chat, you can select who you're sending it to, send it to all panelists, and then um, just letting us know your why there. It's just really helpful for us to inform the design of our program in future years. Um, and also, if you wanted to reach out to us individually, you can do that. Um, with that said, actually, can you just go to the next slide, Yvonne, so that our contact information is great? Well, it's really nice to see that so many of you got the information that you needed today. And those of you that need more time to consider, absolutely take your time. You have until December 2nd to apply. And in the meantime, we are here to help you um, make those decisions. And and have those conversations um, either on the phone or by email. So feel free to contact Stacy or myself, depending on what your questions are. And then, yeah, I just wanted to thank everybody for taking the time to come here today for our informational webinar. And I say this with honesty, we really look forward to reviewing the applications and hopefully working with you guys next year. Um, if you want to stick around while the remaining questions get answered, please do, and otherwise free to pop off at any time. Mm. Hi there. Um, so uh, I had, can you use this funding to gift a bike at the end of your AST program at the, high, at the school for a high school student? It would help promote more students to take part and change the culture of the school. Yeah, that's a great question. Absolutely. Um, I think those grand prizes can be really beneficial. And, and uh, one of our schools actually had a really neat example. They had an inspirational youth speaker come. She's a professional mountain biker. And she started biking because she won a bike in an active school travel contest. So um, we're looking at including her uh, as a guest speaker in our program next year. So that's a really great question. Thank you for that. I think this one's an important one. Uh, do you provide support only for biking related activities or also to walking school bus activities? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Yeah, it seems like things tend to shift toward, toward a lot about biking. Um, no, absolutely not. We, we definitely support all forms of active transportation, walking school bus initiative. Perfect. Like we, we want to learn more about what makes those initiatives work and what the challenges are. So absolutely, we support all forms, walking, cycling, everything, uh, the drive to five approach and things like uh, Janet mentioned that worked for her school. So, yeah. 
Um, have programs like this been shown to reduce vehicle and pedestrian accidents? <clears throat> yeah, um, I mean, we obviously don't have the information uh, and data collection uh, capacity really for that with our program, but uh, there was, uh, this question was actually asked prior. And so I did do a little bit of research and found two studies. One was actually in Toronto and it was where dangerous driving behaviors actually occurred at 88% of the participating schools. And in the study, each dangerous driving behavior during the school drop-off period was associated with a 45%, 45 greater times risk of collision. And then there was another study that took place in New York City between 2001 and 2010, which obviously New York City may not be that applicable to Canada, but gives us really good um, data on, they looked at census tracts with safe routes to school interventions and census tracts without safe routes to school interventions. And they found that the annual rate of school-aged pedestrian injury during school travel hours decreased 44% in those census tracts that had the safe routes interventions where it remained unchanged in the census tracts that did not have those interventions. Thank you to who asked that question. Um, I have a couple more coming in. So uh, I would like to know about how many schools apply before I delve in. So the number Your guess is as good as mine. Um, I think we had about 53 participants on here and it's saying that 11 plan on pursuing an application, 14 need more time to consider. So that's kind of the best idea I can give you right now. And we also have, are you aware of any bike road safety programs that schools use to provide to students? Yeah, um, some of those I did mention. So hub cycling, uh, everyone rides grade four or five, learn to ride programs. Um, I ride has options and yeah, I don't know if Cedric, maybe did you have any other ideas for that? Um, I know hub cycling was a, is a very good option. Um, they do have quite a few um, instructors um, and programs. And um, with mun municipalities, they do have grants um, and funding at a time. So there, there may be a, uh, a more budget-friendly alternative there. Right, yeah. And, and I, I'm actually in contact with hub cycling. So we're looking at uh, including them as a guest speaker because they were so crucial to some of our schools this year. So. Yeah, I think that that wraps it up. There are no more open questions. Um, feel free if you have any other questions to reach out to Stacy or I using the contact information here on the slide or posted in the chat by Jacob. And otherwise, thank you for attending everyone. I hope you have a wonderful day.